Amen. Amen. All right. Acts chapter 20, a very famous passage here and kind of a sad ending. It says they're sorrowing. They won't get to see his face anymore. Uh, I want to look at probably one of the most famous verses in this chapter, verse 20. As we go into 2020, there's probably many churches that will be preaching about Acts 2020. Uh, but there's some information I think that they're leaving out. Let's just look at the verse here in verse number 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. So here Paul is clearly talking about soul winning. There's no denying. He's talking about teaching and preaching the gospel. And listen, we have a vision for Law of Liberty Baptist Church, a 2020 vision, and it's preaching from house to house. This is one of our goals. But I think it's important to, to take the net. Well, so how are we going to accomplish this goal? All right, let's just say, hey, we want to go from house to house. We want to preach the gospel. We want to teach the next generation. We want to keep back nothing that's profitable. We want to show you and teach you publicly. Well, how does that come to pass? How are we able to accomplish that goal? It's one thing just to simply say it. That's what we're going to do. That's our goal. But it's a whole other thing to sit down and meditate and think about how are we going to get there. Yeah. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight is setting goals. And we're looking at Paul here, and I think he was one of the most successful Christians in the entire Bible. Yeah. He was one of the most successful Christians. And if we looked at all the Christians in the Bible, of the most successful ones, they were ones that were setting goals. We don't just say it and it comes to pass. We need to purpose in our heart. We need to determine how we're going to accomplish it. We need to count the cost. We need to make a plan. And I believe that is what is happening here. I, I believe that in this chapter, in Acts 20:20, 20, 20, we begin to see what Paul uh, he has a plan, and he enacts it. So in verse 20, again, he says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. So again, that's a vision, a 2020 vision, not just for our church, but also for your life. Public teaching and preaching the gospel. So how do we accomplish this? How is it that Paul was so successful? Well, he had goals in his life. He had goals for ministry, and he had goals for himself. He had goals for others. And the title of my sermon tonight is God Blesses Goals. Yeah. God Blesses Goals. And I just want to help prove to you that you need to make a plan for your life. You need to have a, a goal. You need to see where the end of your life is going. Everything has a beginning. Everything has an end. And knowing that, well, you need to make a goal of how you're going to get to the end. What is it going to look like when you're finished with your life. And you know, I want you to think about this. We are made in God's image, right? We're made in God's image and he had a goal in mind when he created heaven and earth. He had a goal in mind when he created human beings. He knew what it would take for it to be good. He knew when it would be finished. The Lord Jesus Christ understood he had certain things to accomplish in his ministry. He didn't stop and kill time or waste any time. He knew when his ministry was finished. Now for you to know when something is finished, you kind of have to know what you're trying to accomplish. You know what I'm saying? If we were just to start building a house and start throwing some sticks together and you know, put a window here or there and then somebody says, hey, what about the plumbing? Didn't you think about laying a foundation? Why is the roof guy here? You know what I mean? It, it, it wouldn't make any sense at all. And you argue with an evolutionist and you try to tell them, that, you know, intelligent design, if you will. That yes, there, somebody intelligent has to design something for you to be successful at creating something. Yeah. Every building, every house has a purpose, has a plan behind it. And it's the same way. I mean, even your wife when she makes dinner. What are you making tonight, honey? You know, sweet and sour chicken. Great. How, how do you know when it's done? Well, I have a recipe. I have a plan. I have these steps. I have these ingredients. I need to bring all these materials together. And I will know when it's the right temperature, when it's complete, when everything's together, when it's garnished, when the table's set. It's all going to come together, right? That takes a goal. That takes foresight. That means you have to look into the future and see where you want to be. And then she can say, dinner's finished. Everybody come to dinner. Dinner is finished, right? Think about that. Well, it's the same way in the Christian life, right? God wants us to have goals in life. He wants us to see 
His purpose for our life. I believe that God has goals for each and every one of us, but it really is up to us whether we're going to fulfill it. Yeah. God's not going to twist your arm and force you into a ministry you don't want to be in. He might open a door and close some other doors to get you close to that. But look, it comes down to our choice, our will. And I think it's very important, I think it's necessary that we set goals in life. Yeah, I think it's a sin to yourself if you don't set goals. You're only hurting yourself if you don't have uh, the future in mind, the end of your course. How do I know when I've accomplished all that God has given me? Well, you need to set some goals. Yeah. Just as much as your wife knows when dinner's ready. And it would be awful weird if you sat down and the chicken was still raw. What are you doing? I thought I was finished. We ran out of gas on the stove, so we're, it's good enough. No, it's not, right? You think about it, there has to be a plan and a purpose, and I want all of you, I want to provoke you to consider setting some goals as a family, as individuals. And there's different areas in your life that you can set goals. Spiritual is the most important. Yeah. Setting spiritual goals is very important. And listen, there's an old saying, you will achieve 100% of the goals that you don't set. So if you say, well, I might read some this year. Well, you might. You will hit that goal. But if you say, I want to read the New Testament five times, and I want to read the Old Testament two times, and I want to memorize two or three different chapters in the Bible, and I want to get 30 or 60 or 100 salvations this year. I want to bring some fruit that remains for the Lord. Well, those are good goals. And it's good to have that in your mind and on your thought. And then you're thinking about it throughout the day, throughout the month, throughout the year. Because if you get to November and start saying, boy, it's kind of getting late, I better set some goals. Uh-oh, we better put some food in the ground or we're not going to have anything for next year, right? You think about it. Well, spiritually speaking in our life, it's very important as a Christian for us to be successful, we must set goals. It's important also to set goals in your family. It's important to set goals for every member of the team. A good coach would not just set goals for himself, he would set goals for every member of the team. Right? And you need to set goals for each and every child or your spouse. You need to set goals for you to help build them up and encourage them and for their personal growth, for your time that you spend with them. The things that you want to do with your family, you can only accomplish it or you will accomplish it best if you set goals. And listen, we're made in God's image. God just didn't start, well, let's throw some dirt and some water and then shine a little light and see what happens. Right? That's the evolutionary theory. And then bang! Right? No. God had a plan. He had a purpose. He knew what he wanted to design. He knew what the beginning from the end would be. He knew when it would be finished in creation. He knew when it would be finished in time for judgment. He's already told us these things. In the same way in your life, you ought to have an idea of where you want to go and what it's going to take to get there. You ought to have financial goals. You ought to set financial goals in your life and, and be specific about where you want to go. And I'm not telling you to be greedy of gain, but I am telling you... <coughs> to consider the needs of others and consider what's coming up and do you want to live in the same house you're in for the rest of your life, you know? I mean, if you don't set any goals, you will attain them, you will achieve them. So it's important to have a plan and specifics that are measurable. I think it's important also to have personal goals, both physical and mental. I think it's good to have mental goals and say, I want to learn accounting. I want to learn. I want to go back and reread some history. And now that I know what I know spiritually and I understand the Bible better, I want to, re to revisit history and understand it better. Maybe I want to learn science and chemistry a little bit better so I can teach it to my children. Whatever it is, I think it's good to have these goals, to learn things, to teach them, but also physical goals. It's good to have goals in what you eat and what exercise you get because if you don't have any goals in that, then you're going to find yourself late in life hurting and wondering why you got there. You know, and I think it's better instead of waning until you really need to change your habits to go ahead and create healthy habits now. That's right. I really just want to provoke you with this sermon and show you that it's a biblical concept for Christians to set goals. And, you know, we can't just turn to one passage and thus saith the Lord, thou shalt set goals. I don't see that in the Bible, but I see it in the pattern of what God teaches us from the very beginning. From the very beginning, in Genesis, all the way to Revelation, he uses phrases like, it is finished, or in the beginning he created, and then he said it was good, and he knew what he was after. He didn't just wonder what would come out of it, right? God had a plan, and he made us in his image, so it's important for us to consider that. He had goals in mind, and for us to be like him, 
then we need to have goals in mind, right? And we, for us to be successful as a Christian, we need to be in the will of the Lord. And I believe the Lord has a perfect will for your life. I believe there are things that God will open doors for you, and His desire is that you would walk through those doors. And if you have no goals, if you're just meandering through life, there's no telling what path you will take instead of taking the, the opportunities that God gives you. Now, I want to show you with Paul here. We're going to look at Paul for a second because, again, I believe Paul was the most successful Christian in the entire Bible. I believe Paul was very successful at the tasks that God gave him. That's why God uh, opened these doors and opportunities for him. Well, how did Paul get to be so thorough and so effective and so successful? You're in chapter 20. You know, in the beginning, he's, I think it was verse 3, he said he purposed to do something. He had purpose. He has goals. Look at verse 16, though. Acts 20, verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia for he hasted. For if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost. He has a goal. I want to be at Pentecost. I want to be there at the right time. Well, Paul had determined, right? For he hasted. Paul had a plan. He had determined. He had a goal. He had some foresight. He had a vision. He marked it down on the calendar and said, I'm going to be in this place on this day for this purpose. I've already determined in my heart. Therefore, he hasted. Now, hasting means you're not wasting time. You're not just killing time. What are you doing with your time? Oh, I don't know. No, Paul had a goal in mind. He had a direction he was going. He had a purpose for going there. He had a vision, right? And we're talking about a 2020 vision. There's this famous uh, motivational speaker, a Christian guy named Zig Ziglar. I saw him a few times when I was younger. I saw him when I was a child, and he made a statement that stuck with me for years. He asked the question, are you a wandering generality or a meaningful specific? Are you a wandering generality? What do you do? I don't know, a little bit of everything. Where are you going? I don't know, I'm just kind of wandering. Or are you a meaningful specific? Are you, what you're doing in life, does it have meaning to you and God and your family? Are you specifically trying to accomplish certain things? I believe Paul was a meaningful specific. He wasn't just wandering around from, how, from church to church, wondering where he'll go next. No, Paul had a plan. He determined where he was going. He hasted in his time. He made sure he accomplished his goals. And again, Paul was the most successful Christian. And there's an application here for all of us because we are all at different walks in life. My goals are not your goals. Your goals should be different from your wife's goals or from your children's goals. And I think even the, the children, the young children even, and the young adults, you guys need to be setting goals. This is very important. Yeah. If you don't, well, you will accomplish it, which is nothing. So rather, why don't you set it in your heart? Well, I want to be used of God in the most that he'll give me. In the best possible way, I want to be a successful Christian. Listen, dads, stay the course. Keep on leading. Keep your hands on the plow. Don't give up. Stand strong. Defend your family. Don't let, in, don't let the wolf in the house, right? Mom? Moms, you got a hard job. Don't, well, who am I? I'm just a mom. What goals do I have? I just have to make dinner. No, your life is much more important than that. You're a lawmaker in the house, according to Proverbs. Dad has his authority he gives to you to give to the children. You must instruct your children in wisdom and knowledge of the Lord. You must teach them the fear of the Lord. Moms, you need to set goals that are measurable that you can see success in your children's life. This is very important. Don't just be a wandering generality. Well, how are your children doing? Okay. How do you know? Well, we haven't had to call the cops on them. Well, that's not really achieving any goals now, is it? Now, when you can say, well, so-and-so learned this and such-and-such such is doing that, boy, you're hitting those goals. You have a plan in mind. You've determined, and you're, not hast you're, you're hasting instead of wasting your time. Young adults, it's, it's very important also. I mean, young men, do not get distracted from the goals that God would have from you. Do not lose your sobriety or be distracted with the cares of the world. Young ladies, keep your purity. God's given you such value in your purity. Do not waste what God has given you. We all need to have specific goals in our life as Christians. What does success look like for you? And I think it's important that we all spend time to discover these, and that's what I want to provoke you in, is challenge you at the beginning of this year that you would spend some time and sit down and determine what your goals ought to be and how you're going to get there and how you're going to work with your family to accomplish these goals. Look at verse number 18. He says, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day 
that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. Now, he's saying, the whole time I've been here, I've been disciplined in good and bad, right? In feastings and beatings. He had a good attitude. He knew where he was going. He was very disciplined. He was keeping his body in subjection. After manner, he says, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. Paul was stable throughout the times. Paul had a vision and he was successful at achieving it. Look at verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Right? So he had a service plan, if you will. Right? You have a service plan for your car to keep it in check, right? We have a service plan on our air conditioner. A guy comes by every six months and he you know, does this and does that and just makes sure everything's... Well, I have a service plan for my ministry, for my life. I have a plan of serving the Lord and that's my purpose as a Christian. Paul here took it all the more seriously and he says, you know what my manner was at all times. You knew what, why I was here to serve the Lord, to preach the gospel. So what did I do in my idle time? Well, I didn't waste it. I hasted, right? He put his hand to the plow and he didn't look back. Look at verse 20. And how? I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Again, the key verse, the vision verse. I've heard so many churches preach about it, but they never really tell you how to get there, how to accomplish it. And that's really what I want to focus on tonight. Look, don't keep anything back. If you want to do something profitable, you need to teach publicly. Well, what do you teach? Well, let's learn what to teach. Let's study to become goal setters and goal achievers. Look what he says in verse 21, the foundation here. He says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look, he had a gospel foundation. That's why I say your spiritual goals should come first. If you're more worried about your career and you overlook your spiritual goals, you're going to cut yourself short. You're going to hurt your family. You're going to hurt your physical, right? For everything to be in balance, you have to put God first. You have to fear the Lord first and have spiritual goals. So here he's saying that his foundation of his ministry was the gospel. Now in Hebrews 6, he says the same phrase here where he says here in Acts 20, 21, he says, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. What he was preaching was the same thing John the Baptist taught, the same thing the Lord Jesus Christ taught was turn unto the Lord, yeah. right? Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. What do you mean it's at hand? It's near, it's close. When you go preaching to somebody, say, listen, your opportunity to go to heaven is right here. You need to repent of your own works, of trusting in your own self, and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn unto the Lord, is what he's teaching here. And in Hebrews 6, he says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You know the foundation of salvation is repent of trusting in your works and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way to be saved. Yeah. Stop trusting in your works and trust in the finished works of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jump to verse 24. But none of these things moved me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. There's a lot in this verse, but it's pretty simple. I have a ministry. It is to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I have a ministry. It's to preach the gospel, to get others saved. So he starts out by saying, none of these, th I went through this stuff and none of it stopped me. None of it moved me off course because I have a course. I have a plan. I am determined where I'm going to go with my time. He says, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Now, that's a strong statement. That's a real strong statement. I've said similar things in work site where I had to climb up a 30-foot ladder at the top of a building. Everybody else, I'm not doing it. I said, I'm not afraid. I know where I'm going. God's not done with me yet. And if he is, then that's how he's going to send me out. I don't count my life. I'm, now, look, I'm not saying do things that are stupid or crazy or foolish, but I have nothing to be afraid of so long as I'm in the fear of the Lord and I'm walking in his path, he will protect me. So he says he didn't stop acting because of fear. He wasn't paralyzed by fear or the uncertain future. He says, neither count I, I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course. He says, I didn't not act because of fear because I had a course to finish. 
God showed me what I need to do. He's given me a ministry. I know what I need to accomplish. So to get there, I can't just stop and be afraid every time. Oh no, what if? Well, we never know. We can't go in that neighborhood. What if they have guns? <laughs> Depends on who you're with. They probably got one too, right? <laughs> Listen, our goal in life here is to not just be so worried about our life and our possessions that we overlook our true purpose and the plan that God has for our life. He says, that I might finish my course with joy. Now, for him to say, finish my course, I want you to think about this word finish. If you did a Bible search just for the word finish, well, to finish something is to assume that you know what the end is. Right? Listen, God knows everything from the beginning to the end. Paul here understood that he had a beginning of ministry and he had an end. And he purposed what that end would be. He knew when he was finished. He knew, I mean, if we're building a building today, there comes a point where we can say, it is finished. You understand? There comes a point where we can say, we have accomplished it. It is done. So when he says that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry... Paul knew that there was a finish. He knew what the finish should look like. Go to Genesis chapter 1. In 2 Timothy 4 it says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul's saying, I'm on my way out, guys. I'm leaving this earth. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I kept the faith. Now that's a strong statement. When you get to the end of your life, don't you want to be alive and aware and be able to say, I have finished everything God has given me. There's no reason for me to be alive anymore. I've done everything God's told me to do. Therefore, I have finished my course. If you go on a race, you know where the finish line is. You know where the finish line is. Well, that's our life. And the problem is most Christians don't think about the finish line. What are you doing just walking through life? Don't you know you're in a race? Oh, okay, I'll start running. Where are you running to? I don't know. Where's the finish line? Let's find it. Let's find it. Let's set some goals that we can measure and determine that we're being successful at achieving it. Again, we're designed after God. He designed things with a plan, with a purpose. God had goals. God has goals that are yet to be fulfilled. Now, his purpose, you know, you cannot undo what God is going to do. And I believe as Christians, we will only have true joy in life when we find God's purpose for our life and we find goals that please God. Right. We need to get godly goals and we need to get them done. We need to get on course. We need to get started. And we need to make sure that we're in the right, going in the right direction. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. Now, I want you to understand this. When God, in the beginning here, didn't come as a surprise to God. This wasn't a plan B. Much like sending the Lord Jesus Christ, that was not a plan B. Before the foundation of the world, the Lord knew what would have to take place. So the beginning was planned. It was prepped. It was designed. It was engineered. Everything had a purpose and had a goal. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good. How do you know that it's good? Ladies, when you bake a, a, a dish, how do you know when it's good? Man, when you create something with your hands, at what point do you know that it's good? You have to be able to compare that to something, right? How does God know it's good? Well, he had it in his mind, and he spoke it into existence. And he sees it's exactly what he determined. He says, that is good. That is acceptable. That's exactly what I was after. You understand? You have to be able to compare it to something. Jump ahead to verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So what's he saying here? 
I'm making man in my image. And it was good. They look just like I want them to look. They are just like I... So how did God know what we should look like? Well, he had a plan. He had a goal, and he accomplished it. And once he made man, he said unto them, Subdue it. Have dominion. I'm giving you some charge. How do we know that we subdue and have dominion? Well, it's, it's something we can measure and determine. Are you in charge of your house? Or is your mother-in-law in charge of your house? You know the answer to that one, man. Boy, if, you're, if your mother-in-law is in charge, you know it. You know she's in charge. Well, here, God's saying, listen, man, mankind, get control over the earth. I want you to subdue it, have dominion, replenish it, multiply. God wants us to take control of our future and have a plan. Have a purpose for our decisions and our goals. And obviously, be in the will of the Lord. Yeah. If your goals, are the number one goal is, I want to be in the will of God. I want to be in the fear of the Lord. I want to accomplish everything He has for me. If that's your first goal, then choosing your house, your car, your finances, your health, all that will fit in line. Sure. All that will just kind of fall together and it will just come together as the Lord blesses it because God blesses goals. Right. God blesses goals. When you, set him, when you put Him at the beginning of your goals, He'll bless what you're trying to do. Look at Genesis chapter 2. Look at verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Now, wait a minute. The earth was finished? Well, doesn't the earth need some more creation? No. God planned it. God made it. God was sure that it was finished. This is exactly what he said it should be. This is exactly what he determined the earth should be, and the heavens, and the host, and everything. He said, hey, in six days, I did it all, and it was finished. You know, God even scheduled his rest. Right? He even scheduled day seven. That didn't come as a surprise either. Oh, I've ran out of things to do. What do you mean? There's no work today, guys. Let's go home. No, God planned it and he finished it. He finished what he had set out and accomplished to do. We need to keep this in mind because we're made in his image. Look at verse four. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. When they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth in the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth. Wait a minute. And every herb of the field before it grew, wait a minute, do you understand what he's saying here? There was a day that God determined that it would be created. Well, it's almost like he's saying it was created twice. First in his mind, and then he created it on earth. He designed it, then he made it. Well, in the same way with us. Whatever your future holds, I would hope that you would plan it first, make it in your mind, and then make it happen in your life. Right. This is how God acted, and we're made in his image. They were created in the day that he made the earth and the heavens. Verse 5, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth. It existed before it was in the earth. How, wow. How? How? Why? What? It was in heaven. In his mind. God mapped it out. God made the image, made the pattern, designed it, and said, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we will accomplish it, and we'll know when it's finished in the earth when it looks like what he wanted it to create. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Before it was made, he designed it in his mind. If we're to be successful Christians, we need to become students of designing our own future in godliness, right? In the fear of the Lord, in setting goals that we can obtain and that we can measure along the way. You understand, at the, God knew when to stop the first day. He knew when to stop the second day. He knew when to stop the third day. His, goal, his goals had uh, markers, mile markers, if you will, yeah. right? That's what the runner does. There's a marker. Like, there's another marker. I'm getting closer. There's another marker. I'm going to keep going, right? Think about it. God had mile markers for his goals. He knew when the earth was finished. He knew when it was time to rest from his works. We need to set goals that we can obtain and that we can measure. You know, there's a lot of people throughout the Bible. I wanted to go greater into depth, but I also wanted to keep it as a short sermon. But there's a lot of people in the Bible that we can see that they had a clear goal and then they accomplished it. Noah had a goal for the ark. God showed him what to do. How did Noah know when it was time, right? Well, everything had came together. It was, a, it was a boat. It was complete. And then God, you know, came down and shut the door and kind of put the finishing touches on it, right? Yeah. Moses, you think about it, had plans for the tabernacle. Do it according to the pattern. Moses had blueprints, if you will, for the tabernacle. He was shown a vision of something that God had designed in heaven. And Moses, uh, he understood it. They put it together. Everything came together as he had described. Solomon had a pattern for the first temple, right? 
Solomon was acting on this design that God, basically God allowed and helped put together. But there was a design. There was a purpose. They didn't just, well, let's start throwing some walls up and see what happens next. It doesn't work that way. That temple was destroyed. Then there was a second temple that was built. Same thing there. There was the same thing there. They had a plan. They had a purpose. They knew exactly what, was, what should take place so the next step can happen. Well, Paul had a plan in his Christian life. Paul had plans. I'm here in this city. I'm here for this many days. While I'm here, I need to accomplish all these things. And by this time, I need to be on the boat and now going to the next city. Boy, I mean, what a tight schedule, right? Paul, why don't you slow down and relax, buddy? He said, no, I've got to go. I've got things to do. I have places to be. God has a plan for my life, and I'm trying to fulfill it. I need to finish my course. Well, it needs to be the same way in our personal and financial and family and spiritual goals is that we have to make time and we really have to discipline ourselves to make these things happen. That's hard work. But I promise you, the more hard work that you invest now, the more discipline that you enact now, the more it will pay off in the future. The easier life will actually get, the more hard you are on yourself about keeping these goals and obtaining this vision that God has for us. You know, because the word finish doesn't just mean you've ran out of time. We've, we just kind of ran out of time. Why'd you guys quit service? Well, the power was shut off. Well, that, that would <laughs> apply. But you think about it. Finish isn't, well, we ran out of building supplies, so we just went home. Were you finished? Not really, but we quit. Right? And let's not be quitters. Let's be finishers. Yeah. Let's accomplish a purpose. Let's, let's complete these goals and finish them well. Of Paul, he says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark. Boy, he's passing those mile markers and he says I see that mark up there there's a finish line I gotta go get it I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God that's a high calling that's a big deal when you understand God has a goal for you and if you'll ask God what that goal is I believe he'll show it to you I believe he'll reveal it to you I believe he'll demonstrate it through the scriptures and and show it to you in your heart he'll help you understand you think about the second temple after Solomon's temple was built, it said that that next temple was greater and mightier. But boy, that was a, that was a major destruction that happened. That was a major defeat. And they, they were able to overcome after all that major defeat. And they were just kind of a, a, a ragtag clan that came together. It was kind of like herding cats. You had all these different things going on. And, and they didn't have the structure. In Ezra 6, it says, And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Iddo. They builded and finished it according to the commandment of God of Israel, and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Right? They built and they finished according to the commandment. The commandment was complete the whole thing. Well, we built half a temple. Oops, we forgot the wall. No, look, there were things that had to come together. All this had to work together. They built it and prospered, it said, through the preaching of Haggai and Zechariah. What did Zechariah say? Zechariah 4, he says, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. This man of God was basically saying, The Lord has shown me a vision. This man's going to lay the foundation, and he's going to finish the walls and the roof. He's going to put it all together. This is the vision God's given me, and I'm going to keep preaching this to you to encourage you. Why do we preach in Acts 20, 20 vision for soul winning from house to house and teaching these things? Well, because that's the vision. And that's the purpose. God has a plan for us, and it's to be soul winners. I believe that's a, a very simple fundamental of our church and of our personal lives as Christians. But it kind of requires the preaching for prospering, because that's what was said. They built, and they prospered through the prophesying. There was preaching all along to encourage them. And sometimes you kind of need to preach to yourself. You need to write these things down. You need to set your goals. You need to encourage your spouse and be encouraged by your spouse to stay on course. Sure. You know, I heard a statistic the other day. Less than 10% of Christians have finished the Bible all the way through one time. Less than 10% of Christians have read their entire Bible one time. But 9 out of 10 houses in America have a Bible. Is it because there is no Bible? Or is it because there's no vision? No goal? If you say, hey, you know, I think I'd like maybe to read a little bit of the Bible next year. Well, you will accomplish exactly that, a little. 
But if you say, I have a goal, I want to read it. Maybe, maybe you said, I, it's me. Hey, I, I'm not going to raise my hand, but you, you got me. I'm that guy. I'm that lady. I haven't read it yet, but I want to set a goal. Set a goal. Make it happen. Start your day right. End your day right. Have this goal. Have this vision. Have it measurable and obtainable. Have these goal posts. God has building goal posts. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Where are you, what's your mile marker, brother? I'm in Proverbs. Praise the Lord. Keep on going. Right? Set a goal. Obtain it. You think about Daniel. He's another good example of somebody that had goals and achieved them. It says in Daniel 1, verse 8, it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Daniel had a plan. He had a purpose. He had a goal. He had a vision. And then it goes on. It says, In all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better. He was ten times better than everybody else, not by accident, because he purposed. Yeah. He had a plan. He had a goal. I'm going to serve God first. I'm going to set spiritual goals, and then everything else should follow behind. And because of that, he was ten times better, ten times wiser than everybody else. You're in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Look at verse number 12. A land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it. From the beginning of the year, even unto the end of the year. Wait, God measures the start and the finish? God measures the beginning and the end of something? Listen, I believe God has his eyes on this church and on Jacksonville. And, and we've, we have a beginning. And maybe there is an end, a finish point one day. Your personal life, your personal ministry, you have a beginning and an end. And every year, I think it's good to take stock of what's going on. Sure. God does. God looks from the beginning of the year and the end of the year. He measures our year. Are you measuring your year? Are you setting goals so that you can measure it? If I said to you, did you accomplish all your goals last year? Do you say yes because you didn't have any? Well, that's kind of sad. Let's fix that. Yeah. Let's fix that. Let's set some goals. That next year, I can say, did you finish your goals? And you can say, well, I got this one and that one and this one. I couldn't get this one. It was too hard, so I pushed it back a month, and I'm still going to get it. You know what I'm saying? Think about it. We should have some goals that we can get. Look at verse 13. And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commands, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. There's your goal for this year. Boy, that is the simplest goal. I want to be faithful for the whole year. I want to love God. I want to serve God with my whole heart, my whole soul, with all my being. I, want to, I just want to serve God and love Him. Goal number one. There's an easy spiritual goal. Well, I say easy. Easy to see, but now it's hard work to do. Yeah. What does God expect of me? Well, He wants you to love Him and to serve Him with all your heart with all your soul. Don't do it half-heartedly. Look at verse 14. That I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil. What's he saying? There's a promise of a blessing throughout the whole year. If you'll just set in your heart right now, I want to love him all year. I want to serve him all year. Who wants a blessing this year? Amen. Man, I need one. I want God's blessing this year. I need to determine to love him and to serve him all year. Look what he says in verse 18 in this chapter. Therefore, shall ye lay up these words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. That's that old thing about tying a string on your finger to remind you of something. You know, bind them, ha have it in your hand, you know, have it with you. Verse 19, and ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Now this is great. First of all, he's saying, he's telling you the next generation. You need to teach them the word of the Lord and to set goals, right? You, they need to teach them, speaking of them, when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. I want you to think about that time. If you think about a clock, well, there's only so much time in a day, right? I think there's a conspiracy behind the clock. I think it's backwards, it's upside down, it needs to, st anyway, the evening and the morning were the first day, amen, all right, but anyway, we're not going to get into that, but what, just think about your day, you know, maybe your day is separated into thirds, and you got a third of it sleeping, and a third of it working, and a third of it maybe spending time with the family, or in transportation, and all that, well, when you wake up, isn't that what he says, he says, 
let's go to the end of the verse. When thou risest up. That's the beginning of our day, right? When you wake up, when you rise up, read, study, pray, meditate, set goals. I would encourage you to, to start a journal. I put those little books back there and pens for everybody. Get one, take some notes, something to go back and look to. Brother Ross shared with me a, a, a little nugget of information about a uh, bullet journaling. Cool concept, a really neat way to just dump all the information in your mind and have it charted out to where you can keep track and set goals. And man, I mean, that, that is the best thing that anybody has ever shown me. And I mean, it has completely changed my life and I've been using it for about 12 hours now. I'm telling you, it is, it's gonna work, I can tell. Right? But there's all this free information about how to set goals. Well, when you wake up, meditate on your goals. When you wake up, when you start your day, if your goal is to read the Bible through once or five times this year, whatever your goal is, well, it starts when you rise up, when you start your day. Because I believe, you know, we have busy lives and it's a different situation than it used to be, but we're, th we're without excuse. I believe at the beginning of your day and the end of your day, you got an hour or two that everybody could find some time to really invest in their goals and accomplish these things, especially their spiritual goals. Read, study, pray, meditate, journal, review what you did for the day. Consider what needs to be done tomorrow. He says, when thou liest down, right? When thou liest down, when you end your night, when you end your day, are you ending it with reading? Reviewing what you finished, what you didn't? Are you ending your day praying for the needs of others? When you sit in your house, he says, this is an interesting, when thou sittest in thine house, that's with your family. That's family time. That's dinner time, family time, play time, however it works with your family, whatever the dynamic is. That's an investment in those children's lives. And while you're there in that time, it's, it shouldn't just be coloring books or TV shows. No, he's saying, we need to teach them your children. Put it in your heart, so much so that it comes out of your mouth and you teach your children while you're sitting with them in your house. That's your family time. Your family time is when you're sitting in your house. What's the other one? When thou walkest by the way. When thou walkest by the way. When you're walking through this world, whether it be in work or at the grocery store, don't forget the law of the Lord. Keep it in your heart, in your mind, in your mouth. Be ready to give a reason to anybody that asks you. Be ready to preach the gospel. That's the four times throughout the day. When you're walking through the day, when you're sitting down with your children, when you lay down at night, and I think the most important is when you rise up. When you rise up, how are you starting your day? What's the first thing you're looking at? You know, if you were to write down your goals, if I said, I want you to just take out a piece of paper, and I want you to give me three things that are the most important things you accomplish in your life. Forget about the job, the project, the thing this week. In your life, what are the three most important things that when you're at your deathbed and you say, I've accomplished these three things, I've finished my course, I guarantee you, checking Facebook is not going to be one of them. <laughs> Listening to the news is not going to be one of them. Spying on that old friend, that old church, looking up, what, what are those people up to? Who cares? Right. Think about your own goals. What are you doing every day? Because those that spend time on Facebook and it's like every five minutes they're checking Facebook. Nope, nothing new. Well, that's not their end game goal anyway. That's not part of their course. So they're getting distracted with things that weigh them down. Look at verse 20 in this chapter. And thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house. And upon thy gates. He's saying, write your verses out where you can see them. I think it's good to write down your goals so you can review them. Put it, in, put it up where we can all see it and talk about it and say, yep. And yeah, if, if that means if you're slacking or you feel awkward, you walk by and you're like, yeah, I forgot to do that today. Boy, shame on you, but it's there for a reminder. God's saying, put it up. Make it visible. Remember it. Consider it. Look at verse 21. That your days may be multiplied. And what, what? That your days may be multiplied. I just want to live a long, healthy life. Well, how do I do that? Walk in the fear of the Lord and teach my children these things when I'm in the house with them. Teach by example, lead by example when I'm out in the world. When I end my day, maybe it's time to grab a young'un and sit there and read a book to him, teach him a proverb. When you start your day, are you known for reading the Bible first? Are you known for praying? Are you known for making sure you're accomplishing these goals? I believe God blesses that. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and we'll finish with that. The goal of this sermon is to provoke you to have a desire 
to set goals that will last you a lifetime. And it, you have to start with this week, this month, this year, but really all of that should be dependent upon how do you want to end your course? When will you know you have finished your life on this earth, finished your ministry, finished the work with joy, instead of just being caught by surprise? Oh no, not yet, Lord, I wasn't ready. No, I wanted to spend time with, do, I wanted to help, so, what? Think about it. How many Christians are caught off guard? End. The end. Uh-oh. There's no reset. There's no going back. So if we purpose in our heart now, if we determine what pleases the Lord and how He can use us, and we map it out, we chart it out, we hold ourselves accountable, we become more disciplined, there's, there's true joy in accomplishing these goals. Yeah. And again, I believe that's how God works. That's how Paul worked. That's how Nehemiah, Ezra, Solomon. I mean, there's all these characters throughout the Bible. It's clear they had a goal. They had a purpose. Yeah. Well, that's what we need to do. We need to take it seriously. Like, we are waging warfare and fight the good fight. I have to fight the laziness. I have to fight the flesh. I have to fight the distractions. I have to make sure I'm working for God and let nothing take me off that course. You're in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 of Solomon. It's interesting because you know most people make fun of Solomon and boy, he, he did. He messed up. He deserves all the, all, the back, all, all the bad things said about him in a sense. But here in Ecclesiastes, we see this roller coaster, if you will, where he's like, why are you going after folly? Why do you want to understand madness? Why are you doing those things that you know are bad? But by the end of the chapter, and this is the last book in Ecclesiastes, look at verse 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. He's saying, while you're young and you have your health and you have a clear mind, remember your Creator in the days of your youth. As he ends this chapter, the next few verses, he goes through giving the example of how you can't work anymore, you can't really live anymore, you're at the end of your life. When you get to that point, it's too late. So now, while you can, remember your Creator. Jump to verse 7. He says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. He says, all these distractions, all the mirth and the partying and the folly that I got distracted with, it's worthless. It's vanity. It's nothing. There's no joy in that. There's no reward in that with God. Remember your Creator while you have the chance. While you can live for Him. Look at verse 9. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. He said, look, I may have done some foolish things, but I still had enough wisdom to know it was my job and my responsibility as a preacher to be wise, to teach knowledge, give good heed. That means warning somebody else. Listen, young man, don't do that. Don't touch that. Don't look at that. Don't go with them. Don't get distracted. You think about all the warnings that we see in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. What wisdom. And he says, look, he messed up, yeah, but at least he had enough wisdom to say, whoa, I sought folly. And it was vanity. It was worthless. It was pointless. It was evil. It hurt. While the days, while the evil days come not. The evil days are coming. The hurtful days are coming. When your body's going to hurt, your life's going to hurt, things aren't, you can't do anything about it. Verse 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Whoa. The day is coming, you have to answer for everything. And it blows my mind, you know, I always talk about this with my wife, about, about that guy that messed up so bad that was head of all those churches. And How do you live that double life? It blows my mind. Knowing that God sees everything. Knowing that He sees every thought, every move, everything you do. I mean, the government spies on everything. They want to be God. They know everything you're doing. God knows what you're doing. We're going to stand before Him and answer for everything. Set a goal now. Set a goal now. Go back to verse 9. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. 
And that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Man, knowing everything we know, there is a judgment coming. Thank God we're saved from the punishment of hell. We don't go where we deserve. Thank God for that, that Christ died for us, for all of our sins. But nonetheless, we still have to answer to Him. There is a reward coming, Lord willing, if you're working for Him. And there is punishment coming in this earth if you sneer at that and reject God's law as a Christian. You're His Son. He will chastise you. He will correct you. He may bring you home early. Look at verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's the whole Bible? What's all this about? What is all of this about? What's it about? Why are we here, God? Why did you give us free will? Why do we have choice? What's, every, what's this life all about, Lord? Verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. There's your goal. There's your goal in life. Fear God and keep His commandments. Make that your goal, and God will bless you here. He will reward you there. He will use you and give you a race like none other. I want to get to heaven and I, I want to ask, I want to talk to all these other great men of God and I want to learn from them. I mean, I can learn now, but boy, I look forward to the day when we can spend time up there. But right now, my focus is accomplishing what God has given me. He's given me a task. He's given me a ministry. He's given me a family. Those are my goals. And I have to fear God and do the best I can to keep them. And the only way, I, I think it, that as a Christian, it would be a sin against myself if I didn't set goals. If I didn't sit down with my wife and meditate on these things and say, where do we need to go as a family? Where do, where do we need to make sure we're leading this child and that child and this child? We need to set some goals for the, the responsibilities, the stewardship we've been given of other souls. Verse 14, he says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. I pray you'd set some goals this year. Clear your mind. Pray about it. Meditate on it. Study. Be a student of, of setting goals. Yeah. Google it. Get on YouTube. Look at some of the people that have gone before you that talk about setting goals. There's nothing wrong from learning from those sources. There's a lot of godly people out there that teach goal setting, but just don't get distracted with all... It's not all about wealth. It's not about, I want to be a millionaire. Forget all that. I want to be a millionaire when I get to heaven. Whatever God gives me here, I'm okay with. Proverbs 16, he says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. I mean, we all want to live in a better house and wear nicer clothes and all those things. But if you commit your works unto the Lord, my works, Lord, here ought to be to serve you, to fear God and keep His commandments. If you make that your goal, everything else will fall in place, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought for tomorrow. Don't think about what clothes you're going to what you're going to eat. Don't think about those things. Don't worry about those things. But have spiritual goals first. <laughs> the famous verse, study to show thyself approved unto God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Typically, that verse is only preached in the application of studying the Bible. And amen, that's what it's about. But why don't you study your life? Why don't you study your end? Why don't you study your finish? Where do you want to be in five years? Think about it. Where are you going with your life? What goals do you have? I would encourage you to set goals that please the Lord. Find out what God would have you to do. The Acts 2020 vision is just a small portion of it. But I think that's also a foundation. Preaching the gospel. How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. But have showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house. We need a vision as a church. And we will be more successful as a church as you become more successful as an individual. For you to be successful as an individual, you need your whole family to be successful. That means you've got to have goals for everybody. I would encourage you to spend some time in prayer with the Lord. Ask Him to reveal to you what goals you should have and how you can accomplish them. He'll bless it. God blesses goals. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the blessings you've given us this year. Lord, I pray that you would help us through the leading of